Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday, even though we're pre filming this. But as you guys know, I am traveling this week. So I'm super, super excited to have some footage and some videos to put out for you guys while I'm on the road. And this is a really special episode. This is kind of a follow up episode to a subject that Catherine Edwards and I spoke about last week which are the doshas. And a lot of people have had many, many questions because I have been talking about doshas off and on because it is something that I practice in my life that has really changed my life. And so I wanted to do a part to follow up and bring our friend Stephanie on from Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. I know all you guys know who she is by now, but if you're new here, this is Stephanie. Um, hey, hey. Normally we've been doing a lot of like deep dives and tarot card readings, but today I just wanted to do a follow-up on the doshas, bring it back down to just us as human beings. Cause Stephanie, we've, we've talked about this a lot that, um, you know, you, one of your gifts is channeling. That's one of your gifts, but channeling is just a form of communication. When it comes to like true spirituality, it's really working on yourself and knowing thyself, isn't it? And the yeah. dosha, the dosha, um, system which is a very old system guys this is not a new system this has been around for thousands of years in my opinion for me personally was one of the most life-changing systems i ever incorporated into my life and i know you have just now started this and you're coming from the medical world and so let's start off stephanie i'm going to kind of let you take the reins um <clears throat> again tell everybody knows that you came from the medical background and you started working on, I've been helping you with your doshas mm -hmm. to eat for your doshas, to work, to, to exercise. What's been the biggest like change that you've noticed switching from like a Western system of understanding the body to an Eastern system of understanding the body? Well, number one, um, I don't have the inflammation I used to, um, coming from a medical background. I also, um, suffering with severe, severe medical issues, such as fibromyalgia, ehlers Danlos. Um, I had high blood pressure. I had migraines, um, blurry vision at times. I'd get numbness and tingling in my legs, um, which is RLS. It's, um, restless leg syndrome where I had to constantly move my legs. Um, super amounts of anxiety I would have on and off depression. Um, and so I had all these different things that, and, and doctors could never pinpoint the root. They could never figure me out. And also too, it was very frustrating because I was having all these issues, but I did all sorts of imaging. I owe the hospital, the local hospital, I can't say how much money for the imaging I've had um, and the blood work I've had. Um, I also have a double MTHFR mutation, which is where I can't process folic acid whatsoever, which makes me a high risk of blood clot, heart attack, stroke, depression, anxiety, and autoimmune diseases. And so I get it from both parents directly and I get the worst type from both parents. So I'm a double, which is very rare. Um, but it's very, very high risk. So anyways, I had all these different ailments going on and I started to gain more and more and more weight. I hated the way I looked in the mirror. I hated myself more. Um, after seeing myself in the mirror, my, my self-esteem was very low. Um, I, you know, I just, I had a hard time even just going up the stairs sometimes. Oftentimes I would just struggle. I'd have to lift myself by my arms on the railing just to put one foot in front of the other. And by the time I get to the top of the stairs, I'd be in tears because I was in a lot of pain. So when I made these different changes um, over the last few months, it's almost all gone. And I feel like I'm actually a young person again. I also had my hair fall out on me too. I mean, I have, I had bald patches all over my scalp. Um, so I really felt like I was like a mid in my mid thirties, but really I felt like I was 90. And now what's starting to happen is I feel like my health is not only getting better, but I am starting to feel like my actual age, if not a little bit younger, I'm able, I'm more flexible now because I'm doing a lot of workouts and um, thanks to you, you know, you know, helping me figure out what workout I'm doing a lot of what bar is it called bar aerobics or bar bar um, yeah. working the core that I had such a weak core. So I wasn't counting on my core to do any kind of support at all. I was counting on my legs all the time. And, and now, you know, and that's where I was getting a lot of my pains, terrible knees, terrible joints. So I made this changeover with the exercise. And then I also then incorporated my dosha, um, which 
incorporates a lot of the bots of foods. Like you said, it's, uh, you know, more of the growing on a vine type of foods, the more cerebral air food, like salads and, and that kind of thing, um, less cooked foods. And I also changed my diet from eating some meat to no meat at all, which has been a huge difference as well. Um, I'm probably 75% eating my dosha and just even that 75%, what a huge difference. Inflammation is the, any inflammation I get is really ascension sickness, but then it goes away, yeah. but I'm still functionable. I can still actually move. I can, I don't get the brain fog that I used to have. So a, lo a lot of it is my health problems are starting to dissipate now. Yeah. And that was what happened to me too. Um, I, you know, Stephanie and I have d opposite diets because we're opposite imbalance and opposite doshas. And so that's the, that's the big kicker with when you're eating for your dosha is that food is food. You know what they say? Let, let food be thy medicine. That doesn't mean that an apple is going to help everybody. It means that you have to know thyself. You have to know what your disposition of energy is. And when you know what your disposition of energy is, then you know where you have the propensity to go imbalanced. And that's the thing, like for me, um, I struggle a lot with anxiety as well. That's huge in Vata. That's a huge air thing. That doesn't mean that someone is Kappa can't have anxiety. Of course they can. But when you know, for me, when I know, when I start to feel my anxiety rising, I know I need to change my diet. I need to go back to eating a lot of Kappa foods to help pull my energy down. And it's true. And I really feel like, and this is just my opinion. I feel like the powers that be the bad guys have just made us so ignorant to the powers of our body that we now depend on them telling us what's wrong with us. And basically the only way we control it is by popping a pill. When I think in my opinion, I think majority of the diseases, the disorders that we have are actually due to us not understanding energetically what's going on because our body's always communicating with us. It's always telling us that there's something wrong. And so I struggled a lot with inflammation as well, a lot. And when I realized that for me, I was eating foods that was causing the inflammation, although I had been told that these were healthy foods. They weren't healthy for me. And so my body was reacting to the fact that these foods were basically poison to my body. And so when I switched it, all of a sudden, your body just starts to shed off all that stuff and it can start to get the nutrients. It can start to actually function. And it's um, one of the things I, I know with a lot of people who switch to the dosha diet, they get upset because oh, now they can't eat their, you know, they can't eat their favorite food all the time anymore. But I always tell people that the kicker is once you start to feel true health, you don't really want to go back to eating the way mm -hmm. you used to eat. It's, it's magic almost, you know, you, you feel good. You feel really, really good. And, um, and I will have to say, so uh, what Stephanie's been doing is bar and I love bar. And the reason why I love bar is because bar especially the teacher that I have her working with is really good. Her name is Marnie Alton. She's really, really good at understanding from my perspective of watching her. She really seems to understand how the body works energetically versus just atomically. And as Westerners, we tend to look at the anatomy of the body first and then the energetics of the body. But that's where we're wrong as Westerners. Because the anatomy doesn't exist without the energetic. And so if we fix the energetic first, the, the anatomy will just follow suit. And something that she does with the bar, she focuses a lot on the pelvis, the way the pelvis is moving and unlocking the pelvic floor, which is really hard a lot for women. I would say a lot of women have a hard time with this. And that is a lot of core strength. And of course, you have Manipura, the third chakra is right there in those solar plexus. You have all these base level muladharas at the perineum. That's the root chakra. And um, with the bar, you're also squeezing that ball in between your legs. And so it's creating that root base strength. And so one thing I um, want for the future and what I try to teach my students is that I think as Westerners, especially as women, we've been taught that exercise working out is like something you have to do to either punish yourself to fit into a skinny size of jeans 
to be accepted, to have a body that's acceptable by society. But that's not the secret weapon of exercise. In fact, I haven't weighed myself since I was 27 years old. It's learning the power that your body actually has and invoking that power. Have you noticed a difference in the way you feel within yourself mm -hmm. since you've been doing these consistently exercising, consistently following your dosha based diet? Yes. So I have lost weight. Um, of course, it always starts in my face. Um, in my, I gain weight like tremendously in my face. I get this, I call it my turkey gullet, uh, <laughs> but that's starting to go away. My skin is getting smoother in addition to it and the elasticity and my skin is coming back. So physically I'm starting to like how I look again, but it's not just that, like, I feel so much better. I, I always felt like I was a burden to those around me when I would have a flare up of pain. So I don't feel like I'm a burden anymore. I feel like I can completely depend on myself for anything that I need. Um, and I'm not dependent on anybody to walk me up the stairs or anything like that. Um, so that's helped tremendously. But in addition to that, um, because I've done the, the pelvic floor, the solar plexus and core workout, I've been releasing a lot of trauma that was held there from my past. Um, I've gone through all, all types of abuse in my life. So as you had mentioned to me earlier, you know, we store that in those in the root in the solar plexus chakra. And so what happened to me is and I know you I know, you know, this Bryce, but for those who don't know, I was working out. And I started to bawl my eyes out and I did not know why it wasn't until I contacted Bryce and, and realized it was just all these emotions from pre past traumas now releasing out of my system. Mm -hmm. So now that I've unlocked things, I'm actually finding that because I've increased my strength in these areas and unlocked the, the pelvic area and unlocked the hip area and those joints. Um, I'm now flexible again, where I wasn't before I could hardly even do a split before. And I, I got, this morning I got halfway down and I'm so proud of myself. So there is this feeling of, um, of being proud of myself now. Like I, I didn't think I would ever get back to, I, I was an athlete in high school. I was um, a swimmer. I was on varsity swim team. I uh, played, I didn't play any basketball in high school, but I played a lot of street ball um, with the guys because most of my friends were guys. I, I was friends with half of the football team. So we would play basketball and, but I was able to like maneuver the ball and I was able to like, they called me little mini Jordan um, because I was good at basketball and I was um, on softball. I was a pitcher in a second baseman. So I, I had um, a, a large background of athlete athleticism and uh, but swimming would have been my like strong point out of all of it. And so I never thought I could ever get back there. And it weared me down. I love sports. I love to be active. I love to swim. I hate I wouldn't even go in a swimming pool anymore because I, I felt like I was Shamu at the, at the beach. So I would cover myself up. And so now my self-esteem is starting to come back. It has nothing to do with what I look like, though. It's how I feel inside. So that's a difference. The thing is when we focus too much on the weight part and not enough on the spiritual part or the mental part, you're not going to lose that weight. In my personal opinion, I'm not focusing on my weight. It's just coming off naturally. Well, it's not sustainable. You know, when we mm -hmm. put ourselves in this and that's the idea of nature, you know, I've talked about this before with yoga and yoga is the sister science to Ayurveda. Patanjali, who wrote the yoga sutras 5,000 years ago, also wrote a book on Ayurveda, which is where this is coming from. And the thing about our bodies, yes, our bodies are the Shakti of the soul. They're the, they're the physical incarnation of our soul, but they're not, um, they're not e eternal. They're mortal. And because they're mortal, they're ebbing and flowing. They're constantly moving and changing. And so we, when we, when we put these levels of expectations on ourselves, like I have to be a size two and I have to weigh 110 pounds, that is trying to put something permanent on something that is not, that is impermanent. And mm -hmm. so part of spirituality is rewiring the way we view the way we eat. We have to eat spiritually, which is eating for our energetic body and exercising for, and using our body as an instrument to express the spirit and the energy. It's um, we have these two main energies that run all of us that run through our body. And that's the pranic energy and the uponic energy. The pranic energy is the upward rising energy. 
that is also comes with the inhale. The aponic energy is the downward energy, which also comes with the exhale. Now, pranic energy is often um, shown by the symbol of the sun and aponic by the moon. Men are typically considered pranic. Women are typically considered aponic. If you look at a man's body, they're more their arms are stronger and than their legs opposite for a woman. So you see in the up and the down, the yin and the yang, the alpha, the omega, the divine feminine and the divine masculine. I apologize. It's thundering like a son of a gun outside suddenly. Okay. So if you hear thunder, that's what that is. That's okay. That's okay. Um, and so I tell my students, so in, in the Ashtanga practice, we start with uh, Surya Namaskar A and Surya Namaskar B. That's Sanskrit for the sun salutations. We're not worshiping the sun. That's that's a mis that's misinformation. Namaskar or salutations is a greeting, and Surya is pranic. So we're doing these things to ignite that pranic energy, that upward rising energy. So I tell my students all the time when we're when we're starting the practice and our heart rate is starting to rise, instead of being like, oh God, I'm sweating. Like, can you go into your body and actually feel your blood pumping? Feel the energy moving. That's your power. That's your magic. And actually be with that and settle with that. And I think if we start to look at the ma majesty of this ancient system of, of, of understanding who we are as human beings, it's going to change everything. I'll give you guys an example. So I have um, typically throughout my life, I, I have problems with my left hip. It comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. Um, my left hip sits a little bit higher than my right hip. I usually feel it on my knee too, because the hip and the knee are connected. Well, I got up this morning and my, my, my left hip was a little bit, eh, it was a little cranky, but a Westerner, a Westerner would typically say, Oh no, I need to rest. Then I can't exercise. No, no, no. But in the East I say, okay, now I need to get on my mat. I might have to modify some things, but I need to explore what's actually going. What is my hip trying to tell me? And I did, I did a bar class this morning and I worked on my hip and, um, and it feels a lot better because I got there. There's um, energy gets stuck, right? It gets stuck. Mm -hmm. And, and our, every part of our body correlates. As you guys know, I went through the whole chakra system with Shanti on Aquarius, Rising Africa. Our whole body has these, like, it's almost like you're walking into a big um, storeroom of filing cabinets. And so every type of memory or information our mind is taking in, even our, from our ancestors that stored in our DNA, it's going to take that information. And it's going to store it in a particular place. And the stuff that we're holding on to, it's going to show up in different parts of our body. And for me, that's oftentimes my left hip. Everybody has a part. We're all, we're all human. We're all dealing with it. And instead of shying away from it as seeing it as something that's a medical issue that we can't solve, no, 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 we can solve it. And we can, and that's where things get interesting. When you text me that day and said, you didn't know what, would ha what had happened. And all of a sudden these emotions were coming up. I was like, good. That means that it's working. That means that the exercise is actually working and actually doing what it's supposed to do. And you just got to say, I think I told you just sit there and cry and just let it don't, I don't fight it. I've had it happen about three or four times at this point, And I do, I, I allow it to just come up and just that way I can get rid of it and release it and be done with it. And it's, and it's a little uncomfortable at first, but I feel so much better afterward. Oh, it's totally uncomfortable. It's awful. And that's why so many people avoid it. You know, a lot of people think when they come into spirituality, they think that, um, it's just all of a sudden going to be blissful and rainbows and unicorns. And that's next life guys. Mm -hmm. Like you got to go through, you know, there's a reason as cheesy as it is, there's a reason why the Lotus flower is often the um, symbol for yoga. And it's because the Lotus flower grows on top of mud. And so in order for it to bloom, it has to go through the shit first, mm -hmm. you know, but if we think about it too, and we look at the body and the mystery of the body, especially with the, what Stephanie's doing when she talks about releasing is she's opening up these pathways in her body that have always been there. And these are not pathways that you're going to see on an X-ray. These are not past pathways you're going to see on an MRI. These are energetic pathways. And the chakra system is the base system of that for the, the, the seven points of, of, of energy coming up to the spine. But you also have, for example, when I was talking about the hips and moving with the bar, you also have these pathways that move through your hip system. And a lot of times what happens, especially as women, we lock up down here. Especially if we've had, we've had trauma down here, 
we will lock up. But what these exercises like yoga, like bar will do is they, they teach you to move the pelvis in a way that starts to unlock the hip. And what happens is when you're moving the pelvis in that way, you're also pulling in your abdominal system, which is creating strength in Manipura, strength in all these energy cycles that are then able to pull the energy up the spine, Shashumna, a lot clearer and a lot faster. You also start to move the hips in a circular way, which for women, we're, we're circular. We're not linear. And so it unlocks. If you think about you know, we laugh a lot in Ashtanga Yoga, we, we're, we're notorious for putting our legs behind our head. And people think that's so extreme, but it's actually not. Because what does the femur bone look like inside of the joint, the hip pelvis joint? It's a ball in a socket. And so it should be able to move. It should be able to rotate. You should be able to throw that leg behind your head, no, no problem. If the pathways are there open. Yet. But you'll get there. Right? I'll get there. Most people aren't. So what that what I tell my students all the time is what that tells you is when there's when that's not accessible, it's nothing to be upset about. It's go, it's go okay, that's interesting. That means that I've got some congestion. Mm -hmm. There's congestion. There's something stuck. What's stuck? Let's now go yeah. figure it out. I'm glad you said something about that, by the way, because no, I can't do that. However, I could hardly even lift my hip mm -hmm. about a month ago. And now I can get my leg and you know how ballet dancers, I used to do ballet. That was another thing I, I was um, heavily into, you know, taking in my hand, my foot and raising my foot above like this. I can get three quarters of the way there. I could hardly even lift my hips. So if anybody is saying, well, I can't do that. Well, first of all, if you continue to say that, no, you can't, you, you got to get these negative things out of your head. It's a process. You're not just going to, oh, overnight, just be able to do it. No, I worked hard at getting to that point. I did the work, but, and, and soon I'll get to leg over the head. I know I will. Yeah. I have faith in myself now because I've seen the rewards that I've reaped from doing the work. And in addition to that, the diet is tremendously helped too, because now I'm eliminating all that inflammatory junk in my body. And, you know, we talk, sorry, I interrupted you. No, you go, you no, no, saying, no, 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 But um, I wanted to bring, I, I told you I was having these severe, severe hot flashes. That was the other thing too. And I forgot to mention that. And it was like very, very severe. And I'd get them in the middle of the night and people would say, are you going through menopause? And I'm like, no, no, I'm, no, trust me, I'm not, but... I would get to the point where I would actually hit the floor because I would get so dizzy from them mm. and just like be dripping because I didn't know what the hell was happening to me. And so um, now that I switched over to more of this cooling down, what am I eating? I'm eating more. Um, uh, you had an you know, overabundance foods. of heat. Yes. So basically what, what that tells us in Ayurveda is that she was eating too much too. her diet was for her, for her was consisted of foods that her body could not break down because there was an overabundance of heat inside of her body. And so her body, it was just, it's just cause and effect. And so what we did was we put her on a cooling diet, a diet that cool, that cooled her down. Um, and that's what happened. Yep. And, and I even like, even a little example, I might've messed up a little bit on the diet last night and ate something with cooked potatoes in it. And because I'm like probably 75%, I eat the um, pit of foods, which is enough to really help me tremendously. Mm -hmm. And once in a great while, I will have something off that diet because I'm not fully there, but it's a process. But even this morning, I woke up and I felt overheated and I'm like, okay, yep, yeah, I got to back away from that. Yeah. And it's, and that's not, it's, that's why I said that with Catherine too. Like when you go on the dosha diet, you basically are educating yourself on what foods work for you. And so knowledge is power. And I like, for example, even though my hip was out this morning for lunch today, I had a bowl of tomato soup, which is terrible for me for a Vata because a tomato is, is a Vata food. But I, I, I just, you know, it's, it's kind of rainy here too. And I was like, ah, eh. so I know that I might have some side effects from that um, energetically. And that's fine because tonight I'll just go back and have more of a, um, a kappa based meal. So like for me, potatoes are not heavy cooked, are not going to overheat my system because my system is already dry. It's already cool. So I need more of the root. Whereas Stephanie, 
her system was, and she grew up. I, I, what was one of the questions I asked you about you growing up, about your diet growing up? Did you eat a lot of heavy Italian food? Now, my grandfather was from Sicily. So um, that's what we grew up with. A lot of pasta, a lot of ravioli, um, a lot of, you know, even in the other side, um, which is not biologically my side, um, it was potatoes and stuff like that. All the, like the Lithuanian, Polish foods and everything. So a lot of cooked um, heavy, heavy meals rather than light cooling salads and, and, and things like that. So, so I would have been fine growing up with Stephanie's family because I'm opposite. My body's already super cool and super dry. So my body, my system can handle the potatoes can handle the heavily cooked, but your system was not, is not that way. And so it was reacting to it. Um, and mm -hmm. I, just, it, but how Stephanie, like, this is something I experienced too. And I started putting all this together in my head when I first was introduced to the system, all of a sudden things made sense. Yeah. All of a sudden I didn't feel like I was a walking freak of nature that had all these health issues. I was just like, yeah. Oh shit. I just have been eating the wrong foods for yeah. 33 years. I was 33 and I'm, I'm 39 now, but I started doing this at 33. So, um, for six years now I've been eating this way. Mm -hmm. I felt, I felt absolutely like a freak of nature. Like people would just look at me like, honey, you're, you're too young for this. And I'm like, but it's real. And I would actually be classified, um, as a hypochondriac when what I was experiencing was absolutely 100% real. I've been having symptoms of all of these issues since I was six years old. There's no reason why a young girl should be going through all of this stuff. And then you go to the doctor, here's a pill. And to put it in perspective, I was on about seven to eight pharmaceutical medications. And one day I said, excuse my French, but fuck this. I threw them all away. And that included my blood pressure med. And then I started getting myself into herbalism where I learned how to make tinctures. I have a blood pressure remedy if my blood pressure is high, which by the way, I don't have high blood pressure anymore. It's gone. The one and only thing I still get are headaches, but that's more, mainly ascension or the yeah. something releasing out of my system. Yeah. And yeah, I do occasionally get a fever because I'm purging something out and I just allow it to do its job because as you say, Bryce, the fever is actually a good thing. It's, it's mm -hmm. getting rid of the old to bring in the new. And so my body is upgrading and I get symptoms from the upgrading, but I literally don't have medical issues anymore. Yeah. That let's, let's hit on that too. Cause I know I've spoken about this as well. Fevers are very common. If you're going through an intense, uh, exercise program where you're you're rearranging and you're moving things and you've changed your diet you're going to get a fever for every now and again a low grade fever and that's totally mm -hmm. normal it's because your body is burning something up it's burning up the old karma it's burning up the old you can't you can't create new patterns without getting rid of the old stuff it's like when you have a junk drawer or a closet in your house that's like full of crap and you open it and it all falls out you can't shove anything new in there until you go through everything that's old and get rid of it and that's what mm -hmm. your body is doing it's just burning up it's the tapas we call it tapas in yoga which means heat internal heat. That's why it's necessary to, you know, don't go to a yoga class if you're, if you're not going to sweat because the sweat is necessary. It, it, it needs, it's part of the process it, it, to burn the, to keep, to get the new, get the body to flush itself. And, um, and it's just such a magical thing. And so I, I, um, I would get, I get fevers, uh, especially when I started second series of Ashtanga yoga, I got fevers a lot because I was doing a lot of deep backbending and I had a lot of uh, emotional trauma that I was working through. These, these patterns had been set in my body that I was now having to break and rearrange. And I would get fevers a lot because stuff was having to be thrown out and tossed out in my psyche in order for the physical body to then adjust the, the physical body is only going to react to your psyche. Right. And so and the psyche itself is energy. And, um, and so, um, and so it's, it's just, and it's not and the thing, the thing about the system too, is that there is no, like, you just do this for a week and you're fine. This is a lifetime uh, of you working with your own energy. You're never going to change doses. You're always going to be the dosha you are. Um, and you, you're going to learn to work with it. And I feel like for me at 39 years old, pushing 40, I feel like I'm healthier now and look better now than I did when I was 29 pushing 30. I mean, I look a lot better than I looked a month ago. My skin. Oh, my hair is growing back. 
like literally it's still very thin don't get me wrong but i'm noticing i will take the mirror and look in the back of my head it's coming back um my youth i feel like is coming back um you know it's 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 really a magical thing and i'm just like I actually get emotional because I'm, I'm, I am proud of myself for actually sticking it out and doing it. And I wouldn't change it for the world. I actually, I hate to like sit there and I'm like, okay, I got to do my workout. But then when I'm done with it, I'm like, Oh, I'm so happy. I did that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a reward. It's not a punishment. Like you said, it's a reward. It allows us to learn our body. And the thing about Marnie's workouts, what I like is she's like, play with it. You know, yeah. what, what do you need? You know, you know, when you're in like a split or something, play with your body weight a little bit because she allows you to explore what does your body need? What's your body's limits? What's, what, what can you do to push yourself a little bit more? And so every time I work out, I try to push myself to do, cause she'll give you an option, you know, low impact or impact. And so I've always done the low impact because of my joints, but now I'm finding I can do a jumping jack where I couldn't do it about a month ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm starting to be able to put impact on my joints again. And it doesn't, I'm not in excruciating pain. In fact, I'm in less pain. Yeah. I know. That's why I really, really like about her. Uh, again, guys, her name is Marnie Alton. Um, is that she, she comes from, uh, she obvious, it's obvious to me as someone who has highly studied the body, highly studied the energetic body. Again, I'm the only authorized, uh, KPJY teacher in the state of Georgia who's female. There's two other males, but I'm the only female. I've, I'm literally, this is my job before YouTube. This is my date. This is, I still do this. So this is something I'm highly trained in. And Marnie Alton, I feel like when I watch her teach that she understands the energetic body so much. She also has a great understanding of the atomical body, but she's, I can tell by watching her teach that she's addressing the anatomy by first going for your energetic body. And the way she teaches it, I just can see what she's doing. And she said something. I did one of her classes this morning. And she said something from my head in, um, in the class that I, I liked what she said. And I was like, I'm going to have to remember this because I'm going to say this to some of my students. Replace I can't with I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can't. I can't, you know, run that mile. I can't do that Ashtanga practice. No, you're still learning. Mm -hmm. You're still learning. I can't do that split yet. You're still learning. You will get there. Yeah. You're, and you've you got, there. it's a process. You, you know, Bryce, I like when you say you can't go from kindergarten to senior year of high school in a matter of a week. It doesn't happen. It takes some time and it takes hard work and it takes dedication. You know, there's no easy button to get to where Bryce has been. You know, there's no easy button to lose weight. There's no easy button to just do it. You just do it. And if, if you mess up, pick yourself back up again, and then go back to it. Don't just give up on it. A lot of people are like, oh, I skipped a day of working out. Listen, when I first started, I was only at three days a week because I had to really push myself. And now I feel lost if I don't do my workout. It's like, you know, like you say, it's your secret weapon. And now it's becoming mine too. And I actually enjoy the fact that I'm now working out. And on days that I decide not to do bar, I take my dogs on a hike. I get myself out in the open and get myself some fresh air because being out in nature is equally as important because it grounds us. I try to go outside barefoot. Um, also too, um, we can also mention too about um, one of the things about my legs. I just, this just came to me, Bryce is I was having a lot of pain because I have venous insufficiency. So the blood was not pumping. You have little veins and capillaries and, and all that in your legs. And so I was uh, being on the floor all day medically working as a medical assistant. I was getting little spider veins, which I was very insecure of because I'm in my 30s for crying out loud. And so what you have me doing is putting my legs up against the wall for five to 10 minutes after my workout so that the lymph system or the um, lymph drainage, right, comes back, you know, the, the blood drains back up to my heart and everything. Huge difference with my leg pains. I am not getting nearly as much pain as I used to. It, it's incredible what that does. So that's also important to know yeah. as well. It's an inversion. And so that's, um, and so like I was telling Stephanie, we're going to get her back to doing like headstands and stuff like that. Um, after my practice, you're up in a headstand after the practice, not before, after your exercise, after you've been sweaty, after your body's moved and you've opened up all these values, these patterns, 
flip yourself upside down. Now I go upside down for 10 minutes in a headstand. What that does is it drains everything. Um, I'm not su suggesting anybody else do that. As I tell my students all the time, now for Stephanie, we have her legs going up the wall. If you're, especially if, if you're on your cycle, if you are someone that does practice headstand, I'm not talking about handstand. That's different. I'm talking about headstand. If you are somebody who does practice that when you're, if you're a woman, when you're on your cycle, put your legs up on the wall like Stephanie, because you don't want to invert the uterus. You want to let the uterus stay positioned down, but the legs up the wall is what's important because the calves, your calves are your second heart. They're responsible for getting, getting that blood from the lower body back up to the heart. And sometimes Again, we go back to the, the, the tightness in the body when there are energetically, when there's blockage, that blood has a hard time getting back up to the heart and it needs to get back up to the heart so it can cleanse itself. And so by flipping, you're actually helping your body. Now, what you're doing too, you're also draining lymphatic system. If your torso is going upside down, you're also draining your kidneys, draining your liver, you're draining your, uh, your digestive system. Um, you're getting a lot of oxygen into the head. I tell people all the time, it's also kind of like nature's facelift, which seems to be more of a selling point than anything else. But, um, but I tell my students all the time, if you're learning how to do a headstand, I don't allow students to do headstands against the wall because that's going to allow for uh, bad uh, habits. And the core needs to be strong enough to lift the legs up. If, if, so what you do when you're ready for a headstand is you just position yourself in the middle of the floor. If your feet don't come up, that's fine. Just stay upside down with the torso for a few minutes. And then eventually one day, the legs will just lift up when they're ready. When they're ready. You know, if you kick up, you're going to kick up and over. But they can lift up. And, and I tell my students all the time, you know, being able to do a headstand, being able to put your leg behind your head, it doesn't, doesn't make you a better person. There are a lot of flexible assholes out there. Trust me. There are a lot of flexible, strong psychopaths out there. If you're using this properly to understand your energetic body, that's what's going to change you. I tell my students all the time because of the, uh, the practice of yoga I teach, that's, it's very demanding physically. And I say, listen, you're not here to perform. I, I've seen it all in the classroom. I've literally seen it all. I have been farted on. I have had people sling their sweat on me multiple times. I laugh and say I've been grabbed more in a Mysore room than I ever have in the bedroom. So, um, so you cannot impress me. There's nothing you can do in that yoga room that's going to impress me as your teacher. I've seen it all. I've, I've done it all. I've seen it all. I've done it all. Um, you want to impress me? You want to be good at this? Be a good person. Use this practice to better yourself. That's what's impressive. And that's what we're asking you to do is to use this to better yourself because you focus so much. You just say, I feel healthy. I feel more alive. I feel that's what we want you to feel. Feel that life force inside of you because that's your magic. That's what, and, and isn't it obvious when we're on this side of the battle, battle, Stephanie, like everything they've done to us medically, as far as like workout programs, they've tried to, to separate us from our bodies. It doesn't exist. Number one, it's all man created. So it doesn't exist. I cured myself without a pill. Yeah. Oh, you froze. Now explain yeah. that to me if diseases actually exist. Did I freeze? Oh, you're, you're fine now. Yeah. Oh, okay. People, people a, a common thing too, when people start doing this and we're really working on their body is um, they, they'll grow a couple of inches as adults. So that's like, um, they're well, common, <laughs> really common in yoga. And that's because they're all this like tension <laughs> Is actually yeah. elongated and getting stronger and being able to, to hold itself upright. And so it's a physical manifestation of what you're actually working on energetically. I'm going to do it now. Do what? I, maybe I'll make it to five feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, y'all, Stephanie's tiny. I've never, tiny. Been able to, I've never been able to claim five feet in my whole life, but just 4'11 and three quarters. And so, yeah. Well, 4'11 and oh, three quarters. My dreams just came true. <laughs> Yeah, it happens all. I mean, yeah. it happens all the time because you're, you're, you're. I mean, look at it this way. So this is something I do with my students, and I apologize, guys. Usually, I, I'm barefoot, but I was out with the dog earlier. So this is what I do with my students when I'm working with them with leg behind the head. I don't know if you guys can see this. this is, I've never done this on a Zoom before. So when we're looking at our leg, we're trying to get the leg to go this way, right? Bring it instead of going this way. We've got two. We're looking at that 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 ball and hip. Oh, ball and hip. And so what I do with my students is I have them see if they can bring the ball of their foot to their ear. Now, if you can bring the ball of your foot all the way up to your ear without really moving, that means the leg can go behind the head. 
that means that there's their space there the hip is positioned but then students some students will like get to right here they're like i can't go past it i'm like okay that's okay now we know now we know now we know that there's something in their hip. Now it's like, now let's work it. Now let's get into it. Let's get juicy. Let's see what's interesting. There's so obviously something interesting inside that hip that's blocking it. Let's have some fun with this. And it's not going to be one in one class or one practice or one exercise where it's going to unlock, but it's in, that's part of the word autonomy. You having autonomy over your body. My shoulders are hyper flexible. Um, and I know that that can call problems too. That can go yep. a lot of problems. Oh, yeah. I have to be mine very, out in my sleep. I have to be very careful and about it's like to like a lot of people cannot literally go this far down their back. Yeah. Like you know? touching, yeah. Yeah. That's so that's hyper mobility and you gotta be well, you can tell. Yeah, it's it's well and from in and we and we do like there's a posture in second series, Gomogasana, where you're you know, you're both both sides and your legs are doing something. So that is something that it should be reachable for most people at some point to have the openness in the chest. But what tends to happen for me as someone who has hypermobility is I'll overuse my shoulders instead of using my core or my chest. Yeah. Um, which is where that it should work together. And so that's something I know about, about my practice. Um, and that's, that's because I've got, I've experienced my body and I'm every day I'm moving and I'm, I'm, I'm a, 15 years later, I, I put myself on my mat for at least two hours a day, six days, six to five days a week for 15 years now. And I'm still learning. I'm still learning about what's happening in my body. I'm still learning how to pull up more into my solar plexus, how to pull up more my ribs. I, I, my students will tell you, I get on these kicks where I really get fascinated with one little part of the body. And for the last few months, I've been super fascinated with the ribs. The ribs are so fascinating to me because so many adults can't move their ribs. They're like stuck and ribs are joints. Mm -hmm. And so, especially like when you're a down dog, I'm like, can you feel, can you feel the blood moving? These it's, you should be able to, to move. You should be able to feel like kids can move. Children know how to move and adults don't. Yeah. And, and so, and, and let's talk about soreness too. Now, have you experienced soreness Stephanie. Yeah. But when I feel sore after a workout, I just, that to me, that clicks. Oh, you, you did hard work. Like you it's, it's a good up. thing. Yeah. It's a good thing. Yeah. And I don't, I don't take the soreness as, oh, I got to stop now. No, I make it. And, and the more I move with the soreness, see sitting in place with that soreness actually makes the soreness worse. If I'm moving mm -hmm. continuously, regardless of how sore I am, you're getting that blood to cycle through and replenish the muscles. Yeah. And the soreness it has, it yeah. has to all work simultaneously together. And if your blood is getting properly oxygenated, those muscles will heal so much faster than if you were to just stay and not do shit about it. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, um, I, I, I laugh all the time. I don't think people take me seriously when I say like, I've literally been sore for 15 years. I'm always, there's always a part of my body that's sore. Um, and you, you don't like when you get, yeah, when, when you're super sore, when you start your exercise or start your practice, it feels a little uncomfortable. Usually if I'm super sore, I will do some stretches before I actually start my practice just to get the blood flowing. But once the blood, blood gets pumping, it's not it that, that discomfort kind of goes away. And it's yeah. like when you have calluses, like people have, who have calluses on their hands for what they're doing. That's because they've been using it over and over and over and over again. So you're, you're allowing the muscles to actually continue to develop. And that soreness mm -hmm. is good. It means that you're rebuilding your muscles. And that's what we want to constantly be doing is refilling, re, 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 uh, refeeding and rebuilding the muscle. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you bring up the whole cows thing. So guitar players or string instrument players can actually relate to this. Even like, you know, me playing the piano and flute. I've gotten calluses over the years of playing my instruments nonstop. And even my cards now, I had to get calluses because actually when I started to shuffle, like really hardcore shuffle all the time, it hurt really badly. I was getting paper cuts and, but I just, you keep working at it and working at it. And pretty soon it's like, oh, okay, I can do this. And it, it see, the thing is like when you were to play guitar, it hurts mm -hmm. the hands really, really badly. And you start to get bl bloody, yeah. you know, um, 
fingers um, with pressing down really hard on those strings. But over time, you build up the calluses and you build up the muscles within the fingers. And then it's like a no brainer. I yeah. mean, you still have to work at it, though. You have to it's it's never ending. You stop playing the guitar. Well, you're going to have to build it up again. Yeah. Absolutely. I have a scar on my finger. I have a scar, a callus on my, I don't know if you guys can see it on this finger right here. It's like a little lump. And it's because I'm constantly writing because I'm constantly mm -hmm. taking notes and I don't use my, uh, I don't use my laptop for notes. I, I take it longhand. And I actually am proud of that. I'm proud of that. Too. Yeah. Because it's, it's part of my, it's, it's like a, it's like showing my work that I do for this channel, but yeah, it's the same thing, guys. Your body is an instrument. You constantly need to be doing, using it. And everybody's body is different. Now I'm going to say this again. It's super important. I can, I can, I can kind of help Stephanie from afar because we're friends and I kind of, I know her lifestyle. Um, but for you guys, if you really are serious about changing your diet to an Ayurvedic diet, or taking on a, um, a really healthy exercise program. Well, first of all, I would say go to an Ayurvedic clinic and find a practitioner that can work you, work with you individually. And then from there, either that practitioner can help you find the exercise suitable for you, for your dosha, um, or you can start to explore yourself. You don't want a teacher, a yoga teacher, or a coach or a trainer that's going to be easy on you either. You want someone that's going to, that's going to help you see your blind spots. And that's good. And a lot of times, you know, especially in the mice room, I, when I'm like yelling at a student or getting a student, like, come on, come on, you can do this. It's because I see something in them that they're not seeing for themselves. Yeah. And so that's part of what that meanness is, is that the, the teacher or the coach or the trainer is trying to get you to break through a false belief that you have in your head that's affecting your body. That's what they're trying to do. So it's tough love. It's actually tough love. Mm -hmm. they, it's, but they're doing it for your best, your best interest. So, you know, I, I know Bryce wanted to touch quickly on this too, to help people understand people who are balanced in their doshas when they do the test and how you're still having imbalance too. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was all three straight across this the equal, but we figured it out by what my symptoms are. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So if you're tridosha and yes, and I, I know that's confusing because I say like in a perfect world, we would all be tridosha, but we'd all be tridosha balanced in a perfect world. So just because and no one's balanced, not mm -hmm. one, I don't even think Yashua himself was balanced because he had a human body, right? Mm -hmm. No human, human bodies are always, eb if you want to be balanced and perfect, then you should just be a statue because when you're ebbing and flowing as a human, there's always going to be change happening. So there's always going to be some, some sort of imbalance. Now, one thing that's actually sometimes tridosha people are, can be more complicated because you're trying to, so for me, for my situation, because I'm so dominantly Vata and then my Pitta is secondary. Um, I just have to pull from Kappa typically to balance myself. But when you're tridosha, like with Stephanie's situation, we had to look at her symptoms to really think that was overheating that it because was because of my stuff. overheating. That was the biggest way Bryce was able to understand that I was eating too much food that was heating my system and I needed to cool off. Yeah. And so that was the way that we were able to adjust it for the Pitta in her that was having some issues. And therefore it was causing the Kapha and the Vata to also be a little, it's, it's kind of like the, the chakra system when Mola Dara, when the base chakra is out, all of them are going to be out. Mm -hmm. And so, and so if you are Tridosha, that does not mean that you're just good and that's fine. Everything's great. No, that's not the case for any human being because we're, we're all in a body that's constantly shifting and changing. We all have our own crosses to bear. We all have our stuff to work through and balancing that energy is part of it. Um, and so if you are Tridosha now, Tridosha too, now for Stephanie, she was even across throughout everything. Now for me, my Vata is really high. And then my Pitta, I do have some Kappa traits though. Some like I have, Thick hair, which is kappa, very little though. So little that it's not even on my, like they don't even call it on my chart because it's so minimal. So just when you, when you do that, if you see that you have points everywhere, if you have one dosha, whether vata, pitta or kappa, that's so little, so small compared to the other two, you just knock it off the chart. It's not even a part of your, your, your makeup, if that makes sense. But again, a practitioner will help you with that. If you take the online, the online quizzes, guys, sometimes those are okay, but they usually only give you one dosha. It's usually the dosha you lead with, um, but it's not your full makeup. Usually we're a balance of two. 
Um, and so are not a balance, but we're usually dominant in two. So that's why I'm suggesting you go to a practitioner. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about too, very quickly before we get off, Stephanie, is meditation. Because that was something I, I've been helping you and some other people with as well. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different forms of meditation, guys. And uh, I know Catherine and I have, talk, have been talking about it a lot on with Catherine's channel. But one thing I've noticed is a lot of people have a really hard time understanding what meditation actually is. They think it's a time to like manifest or like talk to, you know, like envision something or, you know, cultivate something. But that's not what meditation is. Meditation is quieting your mind, bringing your mind to a one pointed focus. All right. And so if you're, if you're taking your five, 10 minutes of meditation and you're trying to envision something or trying to, then you're actually, but we're, you're doing what we call escapism and escapism is, is probably the worst thing you can do for a spiritual practice. So I have had Stephanie. So there's one form of meditation that's called Japa meditation, where it's a little bit more complicated than what I'm giving Stephanie because I'm not there to help her. But Japa meditation typically is you have a mudra like Om Navah Shivaya or Om Gata Pye Nama. Like you have these these mantras that you'll be given, and you'll use mala beads, and you, there's a way you move the beads around in your hand. And what that does with the mantra and with the beads is it gets, gives your mind something to focus on a one pointed focus with Stephanie. What I've, I've had her doing is doing just chanting Aum, Aum and really feeling the Aum chant because it's a vibrational movement. That's the name for God. And the yoga sutra is Aum because it has no beginning, middle or end and it's a vibration. And so after she's done her workout, when her body is moved energy, she's done her legs to the wall. I, you just do it for like, what I told you like five minutes. Yep. I do three minutes Aum and then Aum Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, uh, that comes two from, minutes. Yeah. So Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti is, um, the Shanti, Shanti, Shanti is uh, peace, peace, peace. And it's uh, past, present and future peace um, is what that means in Sanskrit. But, um, but what it does, it is it brings the mind to a focus. Now my meditation, I do the Tristana method, um, which I do through my practice, which is something completely different, but, um, but that helps bring the mind to a one pointed focus. So the mind isn't going and searching any everywhere, but actually, in the moment with that three to five minutes, you don't have to sit for two hours. You don't have to, it can be my meditation. If I do a sit sitting meditation, it's only like 10 minutes, right? Uh, just to kind of get everything into check. Um, and so I wanted to put that out there as well as, and if you, if meditation is something you're super interested in too, I would also suggest finding a teacher, a meditation teacher, because there's, there's transcendental meditation, there's drop a meditation, there's all sorts of different meditations out there. And so, um, and so I would definitely, if you're using meditation as a way to escape, then you're not meditating. Medita no one should be escaping either. It's, you got to face things and I've been trying to escape things a lot of my life because I don't want to face it. And now that I'm facing things, I feel so much better and it hurts. It, it's not an easy thing by all means. Again, there's no easy button for it, but I've been through an embrace knows I've been through horrific traumas in my life and I'm sure past lives. So what I'm doing to go forward into this new world we're walking into and especially being there for those, um, we're really going to need us light workers and, and healers out there is I'm trying to get rid of my shit now while I can, while I can actually sit and focus on myself. And, and, you know, we keep getting, you know, Ava and myself got in the cards yesterday on my show, a lot of rest. I mean, rest does not mean don't exercise. Rest means resting, um, not overworking yourself to where you, you're focusing on stuff that does not serve your highest good. You're, you're working on taking good care of yourself. So that is exercise. That is the meditation. Um, that is facing the shit that you either one created yourself or two, you have pent up emotions from someone who created it, but you have to still face those emotions because you're like you say, Bryce, you're responsible for the emotions. And yeah, I've had bad things happen to me, whether it was my fault or not but I'm still responsible for the after fact. I'm still responsible for the emotions that I've allowed to just let sit, stand it in my body. And now I'm facing the shit and now I'm releasing it. Yep. And because of that, and I'm eternally grateful for you because you've been a great teacher for me, Aww. you know, to help me understand all these things. And so, yeah, I mean, and Bryce is a good teacher and she, she's hard though. She's tough. That's the thing. Like you see nice, nice, 
Bryce here, you know, she's very sweet and kind, but when she's teaching, she's <laughs> not like mean. You're not mean, but you're you're very forward, you're assertive. And and yeah. so and we need that sometimes. We need a kick in the ass sometimes. We just do because we love you know, some people just like to stick misery enjoys company. We like to stew in our shit sometimes and we like to hold on to it because that's our comfort zone. Well, spirituality is not about comfort. No. No. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the about most comfortable thing you'll ever experience friction. in your life. Yeah, friction. It is the friction. Yeah, it bad. is facing the shit. It's facing the music. It's not fun. And then once you get through it all, like the lotus flower, yeah, you can reach some sort of enlightenment. But you have to face it. Like I, you know, we've all gone through things. So to sit there and say, well, I've gone through this and this. Guess what? We all have been through. We, we all have a story. Oh yeah. We all have we a all story. Do. And when we, when we stop, part of spirituality is not being the victim of that story anymore. Yeah. It's being um, the victim of the story. Yeah. And, and using every, it's like what Shanti says, what Shanti teaches is true. It's truly what yoga is teaching you is every experience you go through in your life, you invite it in for a reason of, 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 of as an opportunity to grow and learn, regardless of how hard that is to hear. And, um, I've been through hell and back in my life too. Stephanie knows a lot about stuff I've been through and every opportunity that I've been through or every horrible trauma I've been through has been an opportunity. doesn't mean I don't have side effects. I do have anxiety. I do have CPT. I know that I have a cause a side effect from it, but I use that now as a time whenever I feel my um, anxiety rising, I change my diet to eat more kappa. I sit with it for a while. I, I, I you know, in, in the yoga sutras, uh, especially in Sri Swami Satyananda's commentary on the yoga sutras, he makes it very clear that when these little things pop up, when these, this anxiety pops up or this fear pops up, we're not surrendering to God at that point where we're not showing. And so for me, when that happens, cause I do have faith in God, I do have a relationship with God. I go, okay, this is interesting. I feel this coming up now. Why am I not surrendering? And then I start peeling back my own layers. And we've talked about this a lot, Stephanie. I say what's off camera. I'm like, what's interesting with most people, like if it's, if it's um, abandonment, if it's uh, you're going through uh, feelings of this abandonment, what I have been through a lot. I have that too. Um, if you go through guilt, shame, um, and bear all sorts of horrible things, traumas we go through. If you keep peeling it back where this come from, it usually comes right back down to Muladhara, that root chakra, chakra, that you're not enough, that mm -hmm. I'm not enough. You know, and I saw something too. This is, I feel like I got to say this, you know, because I'm just kind of, when I talk a lot, when, I think when we both do our shows, we kind of just let the spirit take over and everything like that. I read something that made so much sense. A couple things. A lot of people with that whole abandonment thing, it's the fear of being alone. Number one, you spend more time than anybody in your whole life. Sorry, my, the sun is in my eyes, so I'm glowing. <laughs> um, you spend more time with yourself than anybody else in the world. So love yourself, number one. But number two, God lives within you. So you're never alone. Mm -hmm. You have God within love. you. I love me too. Alone. I love my alone time. I, when I get alone time, I really take advantage of it because it doesn't happen that often. And I, I'm the type of person that needs that alone time. Holy mackerel, like glowing from the sun. <laughs> I'm like looking at myself. I'm like, oh, <laughs> um, the raptures are floating up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you're alone, it, it's a blessing because you have the opportunity to learn who you are. You have an opportunity to get rid of what no longer serves you without any kind of extra stuff in your ears, you know? Yeah. And I think too often we, we want to be near people and we want to listen to what people have to say. First, you need to figure out what do you have to say? What is your truth? And, you know, um, love yourself. You, you can't have a healthy relationship, whether it be a spouse, a boyfriend, girlfriend, a platonic relationship, without loving yourself first, it, it will not be healthy unless you love yourself first. And that goes hand in hand with eating correctly, taking care of yourself, um, doing something to get your heart rate up. So you do, you know, um, so you are health, you know, have a more healthy, balanced lifestyle. Um, also to, um, uh, 
forgot what I was going to say, but boundaries, that's another part of self, um, you know, boundaries is a, a part of, you know, loving yourself as well. So, yeah. and that's one of the biggest things that God has been working with me because I've never had boundaries in my life. So the fact that I'm putting up boundaries and I'm doing all this, it's amazing the shift on how I view myself now. Yeah. And I can lose anybody in my life, but still love myself. You know, there's a story in the Bible about, um, what was it? Job. Job. No, was it Job? Yeah, it was Job. And I know the Bible is, you know, what it is, but I want to bring this this point up. The devil went to God and said, I guarantee you he will not love you and love himself if I take away his wife, his kids, and whoever. And God said, actually, he will. You can test it. I don't know if the story is true, but the devil took away his wife, put sores on his body, took his kids away. The, the guy had a miserable life, but he still loved himself and still had faith in God. The thing is, true loving of yourself, you can get through anything. It's not going to be easy, but you can still get through it. It's having that sense of self. It's having mm -hmm. that sense yeah. of who you are. So, yep. so anyway, guys, I know we're coming up at an hour now, but I wanted to follow up with Stephanie as it's in the beginning and have a conversation about, about the doshas and about exercise and how really encourage everybody to have a different perspective of what food is and a different perspective of what movement is. And again, yes, as you said, finding yourself through this mm -hmm. and it's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay to sweat. It's okay to get your heart. These are beautiful aspects of yourself as this beautiful human being. And you're going to find all these really cool movements and patterns and, you know, and, and sides of yourself. It'll probably, if you're in a relationship, it might even spice up your relationship a little bit because you're, you're feeling yourself, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your significant other might get really excited about it too but and also too i mean and not to get on the subject or anything it also will you know if you have absolutely nothing there as far as sex drive that helps mm -hmm. you know if that's an issue in in your you know some people actually have that as a problem you know and you know part of that is probably lack of blood flow and or trauma that's another um, part of it which is kind of yeah oh, yep yep the, the thyroid everything moving so that when you are move? getting everything moving you might start feeling a little younger and alive again a little bit more sassy a little mm -hmm. bit yeah, like a wow, wow. crazy around you a little bit more sassy yeah especially if you get that that pelvis moving which is what I've, I've been working on a lot guys my this past year is my pelvic floor and yeah it does it's changed my whole abdominal system you know yeah. and so and and i and i do i know i've had uh uterus issues not to get tmi but i've had like a lot of um a lot of my uterus gets twisted a lot and so i've had um a lot of work in the past done, but just doing this and really doing it myself, I think is, uh, it's definitely re reignited some sparks for me as well, just within myself, mm -hmm. you know, just for myself. So, um, yeah. So anyway, guys, but uh, let me know down in the comment section below guys. This is something that I kind of thought about doing on this channel too. Um, I, I kind of talked about it with Catherine. I don't know if I've talked about it with you, Stephanie. Um, but I, I really, because I do believe that moving forward into the future, we need to view exercise as something very different than how we've been taught to view it. And so I've been kind of considering like getting kind of a GoPro camera and going to different uh, movement classes like capoeira, um, rock climbing, and just filming and talking to people and talking about not just like their physical experiences, but their spiritual experiences that they have being involved in these types of activities that are not typical. Like that's why I love the bar so much, because even though bar, you have pure bar, you have all these bar classes, but like what Marnie Alton does, it's very specific to this type of energetic movement um, in the body. And, I, and so I've been kind of thinking about exploring that as well in this channel and just at least going around Atlanta and, 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 and talking to different people who do different things uh, and, and getting to know what their experiences are. So if that's something you guys want me to do as like an educational to, to learn about these different things, let me know down in the comment section below. And, um, you know, maybe one day if we have a better film crew, Stephanie and I can go and try some of these classes and get filmed doing it. <laughs> so oh boy, I, know. I would love to do the rock climbing up the wall. I used to do that in gym class. I used to look forward to that. That was so much fun. Oh, really? One of my good friends, Mark, who rescues dogs with me, um, he's also an Ashtanga teacher up and authorized up in uh, Ohio. Um, so Mark, if you're listening, hey, um, he's a big rock climber as well. Um, mm -hmm. And he likes it because in Ashtanga, we do a lot of pushing. And then um, in rock climbing, you're doing a lot of pulling. 
And so it gives the body a different pattern movement. So yeah, we have a big climbing gym just down the street I can walk to. So, um, so let me know if you guys want us to do that down in the description box below. Um, and I'll start looking into that. So, all right. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And thank you. thank you guys for, for watching and, uh, and being with us on this ride. And we'll talk to you all soon. Bye guys. Bye.